Welcome everyone to my podcast. I have a very special guest. I am Aya. Thank you for joining. Tell us a little bit about your story and how you got into dogs. It's a pretty long story, but I got into dogs because of my parents. They are, they were a dog trainers and I was kind of born to a training family and was raised with German Shepherds all the time. And then it just started and now it's just me. My mom competed, my dad too, and my dad was breeding as well. Uh, but right now they are like not into it anymore. So it's just me. And yeah, this, that's like the story. We were growing up in the village, but like in the forest, uh, close to the village because of the dogs, because we have all, always like too many dogs. And <laughs> yeah, it, like every day was different. Every day was around dog. We spend our days like, not like normal kids, but more like going for walks and into the forest and spending all the, of the time with the dogs. That's so awesome. So they're retired from breeding and competing now? Kinda. My mom had one male uh, who she competed with and then she stopped. It was like her life lifetime dog. It was her, she has a tattoo of him on her, on her heart. So oh. that was her, her male. And yeah, my dad kind of just, I don't know. It, it was like dogs were his life and then he just stopped and he is not doing that at least for five years. I was breeding in his kennel before and he just knew that we have uh, puppies, but he didn't know anything around. So he just stopped and right now he doesn't own any dogs. I think he he is probably bored and like people and everything in that sport, it just not he's just not working anymore so it's sad but but maybe in the future maybe he will have because he always says that he will have a female again so maybe yeah. his breeding will continue who knows yeah i mean it's hard they've been doing it for so long i'd imagine that over time just not as into it anymore but we'll see maybe he just needs to take a break and then i'll get back to it so is that why you yeah. branched off and did your own kennel uh no it was kind of because we always had a little fight over oh. yes <laughs> because my dad is like i have this kennel and it's mine and there won't be any work from you because it was me who like started the kennel and found that kennel so i guess i was too proud uh, and just started my own because I wanted to have something that's going like from from me so yeah that's why I started my kennel that makes sense I probably would have done the same thing <laughs> yeah so that's like we weren't just a normal kids you know like it is different when you grow up uh, in the bubble you are with the dogs and in the forest and everything yeah. and other kids were like shopping and uh, going for vacations and we were more, <laughs> more like staying at home with dogs because we needed to care about them so uh, but it, it, it was great like I don't regret anything of that what personal dogs do you have now and tell us about them I have grandma Nexi that's how we call her she will be turning 10 in August uh, and my boyfriend's son calls her like grandma Nexi and it just we just call her dead way all of us. Uh, she is a direct daughter of Chris Podlazov. And yeah, she is looking extremely good for her age. <laughs> she looks like two years old, running around the garden all the time and chasing cats all the time. So that's like her thing. Then I have Noki. Like my boyfriend's son uh, calls her Mama Noki because she is the mama she loves just every dog and every puppy so yeah noki wasn't originally mine i was uh, training her for a client in the states but uh, when the time of her leaving came uh i just decided to purchase her because i couldn't say goodbye to her and that's my biggest problem because i'm always like that like i have big problems to say goodbye to any dog i am always crying like a baby 
So that's <laughs> how, how I kept Noki. And then I have Mandy. I think all of those people on Instagram and Facebook and social media knows Mandy. She yep. is my heart female. Yeah, she's just perfect. I don't know what to say more. Like, she <laughs> is kind of my soulmate. Yeah, and Cash. Uh, Cash. Cash is... Oh. Cash is just the only one. He's like such a nice dog. I think uh, I met one of his puppies because they were training with us. Um, it was a little female. I forget her name. I think I, I texted Fall you about it. Fall in love, yep. mate. Fall in love, mate. She was, yep. yeah. She was so nice. She was a nice little puppy. It's nice to hear. Cash is really good. He wasn't supposed to be mine originally. Uh, <laughs> when we bought him, it was like uh, the breeder or the the girls who wanted Cash wasn't meant to be Cash because they had a reservation with my litter, but they were second in reservation for a male and there was only one male. So we found out this litter of, of Cash and his siblings and it was fully sold and fully reserved. And then he became available and we were like, okay, uh, do him, do a DM test to him and uh, why the reservation was canceled. And the breeder was like, because they say he is too ugly and, and they don't want him. Uh, so <laughs> it was my luck, kind of, that he was ugly. <laughs> like, he isn't probably the prettiest, but for me, he is just beautiful. For every of us, I think our dogs are the most beautiful. Yeah, yeah. and I, I just fell in, love the, fell in love with him the day one. He was just perfect he was home everywhere he was he was he came and he was just like he grew up here and yeah so this autumn i decided to purchase him as well so he would be only mine and he would never leave me so yeah that's how it is i'm noticing a common friend <laughs> that's my boston terrier that's one of my dogs too she is living in the apartment with us uh she will be turning one year in a month oh and, she's a puppy yeah. Yeah, but she is more crazy than any of those German Shepherds we have. So she is just a terrier and she's crazy, right? Sometimes the small dogs are in. So tell us about Jero. Am I pronouncing his name right? I always wondered that. In Czech, it's actually Gero. Yeah, like he was born uh, on the garden I was growing up. So I know him since day one because my dad is his breeder. Mm -hmm. And yeah, he is a perfect dog. He's coming from four, uh, one sister and two other bro brothers. And one is actually in the States. And I don't know about the last one brother because they sold him from Slovakia, but we don't know where. And Gero. Gero is a, a hero, I think. Uh, I laugh about him, how stable he is. Like lots of people say is that he has like environmental problems but I honestly never saw any I can say that I have him in many dogs I have here not in mine only but also in clients dogs and you can see like the same things in them and they are all healthy they're all uh, perfectly working and what can I say what they have it's like a speed they have amazing speed just like Gero Mm -hmm. And uh, the head, the head is like, you are never worried uh, to let your dog around kids or these things. The dogs are really, really stable. I think they are really patient also. And to training, they are really good because um, you just like, you can take your time because they are, and they work, mostly they work for you. They are not working yeah, they love balls and they love food, but you can see in their in their eyes that they are really working more for you than for the treat. So that's probably what I also like about him and his kids. Um, I have a granddaughter out of him. My mm -hmm. my female Rue, and I mean, you know who Colt is, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I've met Colt multiple times. I'm really close with his owner. He is so stable. Like she brings him to Disney World. There's like kids all around him. He's good with puppies. Rue has a really similar temperament too. So they obviously get that from him. She's great with kids. Mm -hmm. um, and he's coming from Czech, right? 
Yeah, I'm pretty sure she imported him. I know his full full sister. Really? We were training. Yeah, we were training together, and I was like her cheerleader on her competition. She is a big name here. In her owner is a. I don't know if she is 15 or 14, uh, but she is tra trained by her and they are a perfect couple together. And this year, I think she's starting on uh, FCI championships. Oh, that's awesome. I didn't even yeah. know that. Yeah. You're going to have to send me if she has any social yep. media, you're going to have to send it to me. What do you think the best and worst parts of breeding have been throughout your life? Uh, that's a hard one because like breeding is a really hard thing to do when you go from progesterone through pregnancy through x-rays the birth itself and then eight weeks before leaving to new homes it's crazy it's hard uh it's hard to say goodbye to them it's kind of hard to raise them because with my work we also like need to or and want to uh give our time to every each puppy at the same time uh, so it's kind of hard and yeah, it's uh, even the birth itself because I'm always staying with my females and they are always giving birth through the night. It, even this I is hard. <laughs> I need to know that thankfully my females are good in birth. But Mandy has a kind of problem like she is like a woman and she is vomiting like a uh, week before well oh. and she just is, she's just like losing her weight and then it's hard to like gain her uh because you just feed her and she doesn't feel well because she knows it's coming and she's trying to like put she kind of don't know how to hold the, the food inside of her i think yeah. And so we are trying to help her as much as we can. And then, of course, it's hard first two days when, when she isn't accepting the food or she is losing the milk, which, yeah. is, which is really crazy and bad, of course. So we are trying the best what we can. Like, I ask for many advices and everything. So <sighs> breeding is hard. <laughs> breeding yeah. is really hard. And I'm always praying that my females and the puppies are... Are, are are good but sometimes like Nexi Nexi when she was in her breeding years she had a big problem when she wasn't making colostrum for babies so the first day when they need the colostrum she didn't have it so since day one we were on the bottles and literally it was like a survivor and it was crazy hard like first week when they were born it it was like full of full of tears and everything it was hard the the another part hard part is to pick uh, the puppy buyers because all on social media knows that i uh picked a wrong person wrong person and yeah it was it was kind of hard and last year it was really hard for me to uh continue in what i'm doing and yeah I was really, really like devastated from everything happened. So yeah, I can't even imagine. And that's one of the things that I'm most worried about for when I have my first litters is puppy buyers, because someone can sound great through messages. And then even when you meet them, everything seems fine. And then shit hits the fan and it's not fine anymore. But I'm glad that she's back with you. She just got her one. Congratulations on that. Thank you. What would you say are green and red flags in puppy buyers? Uh, you know what? It's hard to tell you about red flags. Like for me, it's a red flag when somebody uh, texts me and uh, text was the price. I, I am not going to sell a puppy to that person because I think uh, in life, when you are picking a puppy, the price is the smallest price you will ever uh, like spend on the dog so this is the last thing honestly which is important for me when I'm purchasing a puppy so that's probably a big red flag for me and um, it's hard to do red flags or green flags like right now it's easier because I have like many people I know around the world so I can ask on those people but yes. when you're 
think it's more like you are risking and uh, you don't know what 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 can happen because you uh, are over the world and you are selling your puppies abroad and you don't know the people so it's risky and that's probably why i want to stay in contact uh like life, lifetime so so yeah but i can say that right now i think uh that my puppy buyers around the world which i have now and have my puppies i think they're they are all pretty amazing and we have a great relationships and i am just really happy with them all that's so awesome that just made me think of another question are you concerned about the cdc's new regulation and rule regarding the six month age minimum yes like of course i think uh, every everyone in europe is concerned because of course we from here are selling a lot of dogs uh, to the states yeah. and with this it will change for sure like uh yes some people will want to uh wait till the six month but i don't think there will be many of them so i think breeders will just uh keep the puppies and then either way sell them older or just try to sell them in europe but i think everyone here is concerned because it's kind of a big game changer and and yeah i don't think like many people will want to wait till six months because they are losing the puppy stage and yeah. you have a dog or purchasing a dog you definitely probably want to spend the the start of their lives and it's a big difference uh between importing in six months or ten weeks Uh, I just had two reservation to the states, and we will need to cancel it set. And because the girl who had reservation with me uh, really wanted a puppy from me, so I did offer her the puppy I had av- available now from Mandy, but it's too soon. So she was ready in September, and now she can't purchase puppy puppy which she always wanted because of the rules. So. I think it's sad and it's said not only for us but for American people as well. Hopefully, you know, everyone's able to get that rule either changed or overturned or something because even a lot of puppy buyers aren't going to want to wait until the puppies are six months, but a lot of breeders don't want to deal with a litter of puppies. Like if they're not able to sell, you know, near them, you know, you don't want five or six six month old puppies because also that that impacts the puppies too like Even if you try to do as much as you can, you only have so much time in a day. You have to now spread your time between multiple puppies that that realistically should have a lot of one-on-one attention and time and it's a super important part of their life and their development. Yeah, like it's a uh, I think when somebody will want to wait till the six months, the best option for them will be to uh pay the training for the puppy in Europe and then of course the puppy even with the flight ticket everything will be like much more money and i honestly don't know where they are coming with this it's like i think honestly it's a stupid rule so what does your typical day look like with all the dogs Ooh, it's crazy every day. Uh, we are trying to get up early every day. Sometimes it's possible to get up at like six. Sometimes so we can like get up at nine because we are extremely tired. Um, we are walking the dogs, brushing the dogs, doing nails. It depends on the day. It's really like uh always doing what we need. Uh, every Monday is like crazy, which is today. and it's full of documents and posts and papers and everything uh then we are trying to work every of the dogs so we are going for tracking obedience sometimes we or two times per week we have a protection training and then of course you have when you have a litter there is socialization and work with the puppies and uh getting up like when i had g litter now because we are moving we we live like five minutes from the place where our dogs live mm-hmm. uh because in the house is still my dad and we are 
hopefully probably moving there in the end of June. So we will be finally on the one place. But when Mandy had her G-Litter right now, it was I was going to the puppies every two hours, which was really crazy. Yeah. I was extremely tired. But yeah, like every our day starts really soon and early. And the day ends really, really late. So, like we are going from the dogs with dark. So yeah, it's like, but every day is different. So I can't like fully say how our days look because yep. every other day is different we are always doing something different with or just a different phase with different dogs it's still it's like it's different every what do you do on your off time uh we honestly had a day off on saturday uh after like two months and we very much needed it uh, and we went for a, for a bike. It was a day off, but we still drove uh, 60 kilometers. So it was a, a whole day trip. And yeah, so it was kind of like clearing our heads uh, before everything going again pretty hard. So yeah, we had one day off for a lot. <laughs> two months since March it was crazy like when the season started it was just in one circle and trials 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 training spending every day like from the morning to the to the dark with dogs yeah it was just one day and we are back in work but and and we still wear with the dogs of course because feeding yeah. them walking them <laughs> so yeah days off are important it's easy to burn out you know, because your whole day is just revolving around the dogs, taking care of the dogs, training the dogs. And even if it's just a day, one day in between, it's still important. So how many dogs titled in IG? Um, my first dog was a black female, Queena. She was titled till IGP3. Uh, then I have uh, Benny. Uh, he was titled till IGP3 as well. Uh, Naomi till IGP3 as well. These were my dogs, which are already over the rainbow. And that's why my clan name is Kwana Bev, because uh, Q-W-E, it's for Queena, B-E, it's for Benny, and N A is for Naomi, and A-N is for my Mandy. So, yeah, it was, it was kind of easy to, to pick that name. Yeah, so then I had Noki till IGP too. Mandy till I GP3. Uh, then I had Eleanor for Brazilian client Beatrice, and she was titled till I GP2 as well. Cash is uh, I GP2 now. Uh, Herb, uh, his full brother, which I sent to my client and my best friend in the States, uh, Jess, uh, last year. She was he was still I GP2 as well. Then Belgian Shepherd, of course, he had. And Victoria is a IGP three right now. At the IGP one, and that should be probably probably all. Like I counted that I have six dogs with IGP three. Ati is now IGP one, and she just started. And I am in preparation with other dogs for for IGP one, so they will be hopefully soon titled as well. Uh, but I think that's all. Uh, six six ducks till IGP three and then Ati with IGP one. So, what are your favorite and least favorite behaviors to teach in obedience and protection? Um, I think in obedience, it will it will okay. be definitely feeling training. I think uh, that's probably what I love the most on obedience, and I think long attacks on protection. Yeah, and I could, yeah, I could see it that. would be probably it. I could just. What's your favorite phase? Is it tracking? Honestly, depends on the dogs. Uh, <laughs> you have dog and he is great in everything. So you just enjoy every phase with him. And then you have a dog uh, when you know that the dog is like more stubborn and doesn't enjoy this phase as much as you as you are enjoying that. So really depends on the dog. Like, uh, I love trekking, but when you have 
a dog who is not much interested, it's pretty hard and frustrating, but it's yeah. the same with, with all, all phases. So I think I will start with the answer that it depends on a dog because every dog is different and every training is different and then your fun from the training is different. What training tools are you guys allowed to use? Because you can't use e-collars, right? Be in Czech or in Slovakia, Germany, I think it will have probably most of European countries. We are not allowed to use the e-collar. Yeah, people, it's not like crazy as in like Sweden or Finland. Uh, so we can use it for a dog which are like death. Uh, then we can use it. And it's like you are not allowed to use it, but almost like lots of people here use that and just doesn't post about it yeah i think somebody asked this question when you do retrieves with dogs do you use force fetch is that your method mm -mm. i am going from holding the dumbbell so that's the first thing i'm learning and i'm learning to a puppy and then we are starting when holding then i want more time with holding and then uh i am letting the dog to pick it up to me then i am on a big distance from the dog and how, this is how i work till the final final whole exercise but i don't like to use like any force in the training because you know what i had a lot of dogs in training which uh, knew uh, people who used force on them and honestly i have that dog that kind of dog right now in training and it's extremely hard to put it in one piece because uh, the female will be always, always unhappy from the whole phase, which were done in a bad way for her. And I don't think force is the way. I think uh, explanation and a positive training, of course, sometimes you need to use some force when the dog is stubborn on, or something. I, I won't be saying like no because that's kind of not possible it's like yeah. with a kid like it's the same but the dog needs to fully understand what you want that's like the first thing uh, i have a female which i just told about uh, she is two and a half years old and i bring her brought her in last year in may and the female is perfect. She is social. She is happy. She is uh, kind. She is always cuddling. But somebody did a real damage on her obedience. And it's kind of impossible to put her in shape where she can be happy and enjoying the obedience. And it's hard. It's hard to to look at her, to enjoy the training because everything you are doing, you are just going to the bad start she had and it's it's just hard it's like i'm always uh i'm always angry or crying because it's like you're doing something and it takes you nowhere because she is still sad no matter how much you are trying you still see how uncomfortable she is oh that's so sad yeah do you own any other breeds besides german shepherds someone asked this yeah Boston Terrier, <laughs> the guardian right now. Would you ever own a Malinois? Well, I love German Shepherd and I had the possibility to train Belgian, yep, uh, but he was a hard dog and <laughs> he bit me many times, many times in training. Oh uh, he was going for my hand or something. Like there was a 30 degrees in Italy and I was wearing winter jacket for him to not go on me oh but gosh. I don't think it was actually in him I think it was like some training there was made and made him that way because he reacted on correction and that was the only thing when he did it it, it just I just pulled the leash and he was on me so I don't think that was that it was something he had inside him because otherwise if it wasn't obedience or protection he was absolute absolute sweetheart in daily life 
And when I compare that Belgian Shepherd is much more like your dog, you know, like when he cuddles you, feels like he is part of you. Uh, that was with force. I felt like he is go wants to be inside me. It's hard about the head because I believe like German Shepherds are more normal or normal sounds so bad. Uh, like. No. I think most people understand what you're what you mean. They are yeah. more normal. <laughs> it's like but my boyfriend want to try Malinois probably. Oh no. <laughs> yeah, uh but the sire and the dam of the litter looks really nice and I like them both. Uh, so maybe maybe we will have one Malinois for him to try because it was his dream and I even though it makes me a little bit sad I can take it away from him. So. Well, my husband has a Dutch Shepherd, so I know how you feel. Oh. Um, they're they're the same thing, and yeah, he's he's not normal. I'll I'll say that <laughs> he's definitely not normal. He's a nice dog, but normal isn't a word I use to describe him. Um, so someone else asked, what what tips do you have for adding duration and healing? Uh, I am using uh, a whip uh, to like uh, let the dog be and try bark and then transfer the energy from that to the healing. It's like like protection, like you are getting the drive with barking from the dog. He wants to bite and then you send him for a long attack or for the bite and the drive is there. So I kind of transfer this to obedience as well but also is different with with every dog. But mostly it's a whip uh, or a ball. Honestly, great thing which helped me uh, for duration as well was the IQ West. I'm training with that a lot. And when the dog understands the West, it's the best thing for healing out there. So yeah, I, I do the same thing um, with, with one of my dogs is same thing, just kind of using different protection tools like the whip. Just to, just to bring out that energy too. What are your future goals for your breeding program? And do you have any upcoming litters? Uh, like, I think like every breeder, I would love to have uh, a world champion as my offspring one day. Um, I'm like, I'm happy with every family I pick and with every puppy is my goal to pick the right human for them and I think that's the biggest goal with with my kennel to always uh, breed dogs which are capable of being perfect sport dogs and healthy and also um, just be normal in daily life like you can take them for a trip but you can go uh, swimming with them you can go on the boat with them and they are just normal and I think that's my biggest goal to uh, breed the dogs, which are great in the stadium, but also great in family daily life. And that would be probably the goal. What upcoming litters do you have? Uh, right now we are expecting uh, Noki and Anger in uh, like 24 days. So yeah, she looks like a whale to be <laughs> on. She is like huge. I don't know where where she got it. So it's like crazy. She like she looks like she has one week till birth. It's 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 impossible. And yeah, we are waiting for Victoria's season uh, to breed her with cash. I'm personally extremely extremely happy about this litter. Uh, then I we are we have a new arrival tomorrow. And she is my client's dog, but she will have a litter here as well. Uh, but I didn't introduce yet, but I can say that the female is a dark sable and the male will be a really nice dog. And I think we will get a really nice uh, sables. Yeah, uh, Rory and Gero is what I want to do in autumn. And uh, I also picked a sire for Mandy in the in the end of this year more like uh beginning of 2025 and we will go to Spain with her this time so yeah what are your upcoming seminars because you're coming to the U.S. right uh next Thursday and uh, to San Jose again I was there last year in March and uh, I'm returning back there and we are there till 8th of June. 
Is it a club that's hosting you or yep. like private trainers? What's the club called? Uh, San Jose, German Shepherd Club. And then the last question I got was, what advice do you have for new handlers wanting to get into IGP? Um, definitely listen and learn. Uh, that's probably the biggest advice. I had a many uh, clients who started into the sport and sometimes young people were really hard for me to train. Uh, then I found out from one girl that I'm the worst trainer at all, uh, all of all times. And she started, she never passed any, any title, but she started her own school. And I was feeling like a shit, honestly. It was kind of frustrating, but then I was like, oh, okay, just learn and listen and be patient for sure. Because in dog sport, uh, this is something you need to be patient, always wants to be open to new things because IGP is beautiful in every way. And in a way, IGP is still developing. But every year you have new methods, you have like many things are going more and more up and uh, the best thing is to watch learn watch videos working dog we have we are we are living in a time we can use any video and and see and watch go for competitions so yeah that would be probably and probably if you don't know what to do don't be afraid to ask because like normal people or people who are not close to the public will always be happy to hear and help you. So I think that's that's the most important thing. Be patient because dog sport is hard. <laughs> it is. How old were you when you did your first competition? I know you guys have uh, like competition in the USA. We have like our trials are only like passing title or passing exam. And it's not like competition. And then we have like competitions, which are like races. And so my competition was when I was 13. Oh, wow. And first exam was like, first title was like when I was seven. That is crazy. Yeah, that is crazy. I have somewhere a picture of me and the judge standing. And I was like trying to be a judge too. So I'm just standing there with this face and I'm like, proud of being like a judge in like six years and it's hilarious i mean you've been doing this and doing it so well for years you're you're definitely very talented i love the videos you post i feel like every day you post on your story you're like oh i just got a, an igp1 we just we just closed this title we just did that so congrats <laughs> you're you're killing it out there and, and definitely an inspiration too for any up-and-coming trainers in igp especially for for women i would definitely say that you're you've been a good role model Thank you so much. It's You're really warms my heart. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay, so those are all the questions I have. Thank you for joining the podcast. Um, I really appreciate it. And we all hope you have a great